My name is Nicolás Kachanowski. I am an associate professor of economics and the associate director of the economics department Exploring Economic Freedom Project. Uh, the Exploring Economic Freedom Project is a MSU Denver Economics Department academic project that started in 2007. Uh, its mission is to enhance the education, ex educational experience of our students by providing an academic forum for open scholarly discussion in the form of lectures, debates, panel discussions, and reading colloquia and other issues that students will find interesting. Uh, the project seeks to educate and to inform our students on issues related to economic freedom, political freedom, and civil liberties. Uh, the project engages in understanding the reasons for economic growth, economic development, entrepreneurship, and a more peaceful and prosperous society. Uh, the Exploring Economic Freedom Project has been generally funded by an annual grant from the uh, Charles Scott Charitable Foundation. Our speaker today is Brian Kaplan. Uh, Brian Kaplan is <laughs> a professor of economics at George Mason University, and he's a blogger at EconLog. Uh, if you like to read economics blog, you should read his posts. Uh, I do. <laughs> uh, he's the author of uh, Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids, Why Being a Great Parent is Less Work and More Fun Than You Think, uh, The Means of the Rational Voter, Why Democracies Choose Bad Policies, this book was named the best political book of the year by the New York Times. And the case, case against education, why education system is a waste of time and money, which is the topic of his talk today. Interesting. Um, his scholarly work has been widely covered in various media, such as CISPAN 2, PBS, USA Today, Washington Times, Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, The Financial Times, The New York Times, The New York Times Magazine, and The New Yorker, and he has also published more than 40 journal articles in peer-reviewed journals. He's uh, currently writing in with Saturday morning breakfast serials, Zach Wainersmith on All Roads Leads to Open Borders, a non-fiction graphic novel on the philosophy and social science of immigration. So why, why this topic? Um, in, in 2008, the student debt, uh, student debt loan so to 1.5 trillion and student loan delinquency or default rates increased by 10.7%. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York's, the labor market for recent college graduate report shows that the underemployment rate, which is defined as the share of graduate with working, uh, sorry, a share of graduates working in jobs that typically do not require a college degree, is above 43%. It is not surprising that Brian Kaplan's book uh, has gathered a lot of attention among academics and intellectuals, but also in the media. Brian Kaplan's book is the product of six years of scholarly investigation into the vast amount of empirical research that has been done in social sciences attempting to measure the returns to education. Today, Brian Kaplan is going to share with you some of the highlights of his book, discussing the result of his Vast literature and his recommendations. He will then take your questions, but keep in mind this is uh, an academic event, scholarly forum, and therefore we ask you uh, to treat our guests with respect and courtesy and also to ask questions instead of making long statements. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Brian Kaplan to Metro State. Uh, thanks very much for that kind of introduction, and uh, thanks to everyone for showing up. I'm going to talk about something that we all have a lot of familiarity with. If you're here, you've probably been in school for at least 13 years. Uh, I've been in school now for 42 years. And let's begin with something that we've all heard about, the normal view of education. Uh, almost everyone says that we should have more and better education. Uh, if you can imagine a politician getting in front of a national debate and saying, do you know what we need to do with education? Have less and worse education. Uh, you would be booed off stage, this would sound ridiculous. You know, both of the last Bush presidents said they wanted to be the education president. 
Uh, this is also a rare case where economists and the public actually agree that we're not investing enough. Uh, my first book, The Myth of Rational Voter, talked a lot about all of the areas where economists and the public disagree. This is actually not one of them. Right? So when I go and talk to other economists, usually they also think of education as one of the very best things that countries can do for economic development. Right? And why would they think this? Well, I mean, uh, what, what economists usually do when they're thinking about education is to say, well, let's think about it like any other investment. You can invest in real estate, you could invest in bonds, or you can invest in a college degree. Right? And all of these, we can go and run the financials and take a look and see how well they pay compared to how much they cost and come up with a rate of return estimate, right? And usually these come out to be pretty high, right? So uh, to most economists who look at this, they'll say, well, this, is, this shows what we already kind of thought, which is that school clearly builds human capital. You go to school, you sit in class, and they pour job skills into you. And as a result of that, you are able to make more money after you graduate, right? So you've probably heard this story many times. Uh, which brings us to the big puzzle about education. This is something that I've been thinking about since I was five years old, just looking at what was being said by the teachers, the work that I had to do. It's this, when you actually experience education, it's hard not to notice that most classes teach no job skills. Most classes teach no job skills. You go there, it's taught by someone who has almost no practical experience other than as a teacher. The content seems largely irrelevant to the real world. After the final exam, you'll probably never need to know it again, and yet, that's the content. Uh, so like right now, my younger son is learning Virginia history. I can't tell you how important it is to know the history of the state of Virginia. Without that, how could you even participate in the modern world, right? All right, so just go through your mental inventory of classes that you've done and jobs that you can really uh, seriously imagine doing. So like what fraction of US jobs ever use knowledge of history? Like, what jobs are there where if you didn't know history, you would find yourself unable to actually do the job? It's pretty hard to imagine what those jobs would be other than a course history teacher, right? So, yeah, so it may be that you wind up going on to teach the very subject that you had to learn yourself, but besides that, besides that, when would you actually use history in the real world? Or uh, higher mathematics. So how many jobs actually are there that use trigonometry? Uh, you might remember being a kid in high school and there's some smart aleck in the back of the class who raises his hand and says, so when are we going to use uh, trigonometry in real life? And the teacher might have given him a smug look like my trigonometry teacher did and said, well, you'll, you'll see. All right, so have you seen? Have you seen all the times trigonometry comes up in real life? You know, like when's the last time that you took an arc tangent? Unless, of course, you're a math major. All right, and then uh, music and art which you might say, well, this stuff isn't actually for, you know, this isn't actually for preparing people for their future, but the stuff is required usually. So, you know, like when my kids were in fifth and sixth grades, they were at a school where there were three required music classes. Three, so they had to have chorus required, dance required, and music appreciation required. They weren't too happy in those classes, so I called up the vice principal and said, is there any way they can get out of like, one of them? and just go to the library, is that possible? He says, no, all students must dance. All students must sing. All students must appreciate, all right? And of course, if we had simply defied the system and said, well, look, we're not doing this, and we defied it all the way through high school, right, you just can't graduate. And if you can't graduate from high school, then good luck going to college, big problem. All right, you know, Shakespeare, like how often in real life do you need to know English as was, was spoken three or 400 years ago? I mean, like, when would you, it actually happen that, it, that you need to know what wherefore means? So, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Uh, which means, it doesn't mean where, it means why. But, uh, you know, you're not, you, don't need, you can forget that safely because you're not going to need to know it again. All right. Or how about uh, foreign languages? Now, in Europe, this is different. In Europe, they actually learn foreign languages. Uh, but here in the U.S., uh, for this book, I went and tracked down the data on how many Americans even claim to have learned to speak a foreign language very well in school. Right, and the number's under 1%. Under 1% of Americans even claim to have learned to speak a foreign language very well in school. You can think about your own foreign language experience. So like how many people here had like two years of foreign language or more? Yeah, three years, four. Like what, what is actually required to get in, into MSU? Do you need two years, three years? What's the, anyone know the requirement? So it's only two, all right. So I'm from California. There to get into either of the state school systems, three years required. All right, so. 
you can sit around and say that you know, we live in a globalized world where it's important to know other languages. And is that really true? Yeah, it's a globalized world where people, where people are learning English at a breakneck speed. But in any case, even if it was important to learn foreign languages, this is no defense of the foreign language teaching that we have because almost no one learns a foreign language in school, period. All right, and then, of course, you got the teaching of dead languages, like Latin. All right, what's the point of that? Right, Latin almost died out about 30 years ago, and now it's revived, and now I think it's like 5% of kids are studying Latin as their language in high school. Like, when would this come up in real life? You know, like, would you like, fall into a time machine and end up in ancient Rome, and then thanks to high school Latin, you're able to actually get by? I don't know, like, what's the other scenario where Latin is going to be really helpful to you? Yeah, so anyway, uh, if you are in any way defiant, and yeah, I'll say, I, I was a bit of a defiant student, but if you have you know, even a little bit of defiance in you, you may have often been tempted when a teacher is teaching a subject to think at least, well, you know, what does this have to do with real life? When am I actually going to use this? Why do I need to know this stuff? Right. Now, uh, to me, this is the motivation for the book because this all seems awfully strange. It's not that strange that teachers would make you learn useless stuff. You know, there you might say, well, you know, it's a nonprofit system. People take the path of least resistance. Teachers just teach whatever their teachers taught them. Those teachers taught whatever their teachers taught them. It's all just like a bad chain letter, and that's the system. All right, but that by itself is dysfunctional, but it's not that strange. Here's what's strange. Employers care. Employers care. That's weird. Employers care if you refuse to take a foreign language in high school. How do they care? Well, if you don't take your foreign language in high school, you can't finish high school. You can't finish high school, don't go to college, which means that there are a great many jobs that you are not going to be able to get. A great many jobs where your application will be thrown in the trash without further examination because you didn't have the right pieces of paper behind you. All right, and again, it seems like employers, they're in the real world, they're, they know what they need for, uh, in, order, in order to get the job done. So what in the world's going on? Can it really be the case that you need to know history and Latin in order to work in a modern American office? Does that make any sense? And this is where we come to the heart of my book and the main explanation for this. And again, the whole idea, I'm trying to resolve the paradox of education seems financially lucrative, important for your career, and yet also packed with useless and irrelevant material. How can both things be true? How can both things be true? And it's actually easy to explain all these facts using something that economists call the signaling model of education. The signaling model of education. Uh, here's the main idea. First of all, of course there is some useful education. So I don't want to give you the wrong idea. I'm not claiming that reading is not important. There's a lot of jobs that use reading, actually, right? Shockingly, you know, there's a lot of jobs where reading is important, a lot of jobs where writing is important, there's a lot of jobs where arithmetic's important, right? There's plenty of jobs in computer science, right? So there's a whole bunch of jobs that do use stuff that you learn in school. And for that, I'll just go and give the normal theory. The normal theory that you go to school, you learn some skills, employers want those skills, so they pay you more. No, no puzzle. But what about all the other stuff? What is going on with all these other weird classes that you have to take? Right? Why do employers care about those? And here's the signaling explanation. So some schooling raises your productivity. I don't deny it. But a lot of it is what we could call hoop jumping. Jumping through a hoop in order to impress others. Like you jump through a hoop and then you go, ta-da, look at me. I jumped through four years of Latin. I got all A's. I'm amazing, aren't I? All right? Everyone should now applaud me right, for my Latin accomplishment. So a lot of schooling is hoop jumping to show off or to signal, same, work, you know, same concept, things like your intelligence, your work ethic, and also just your sheer sheep-like conformity. You know, I think we all know someone who's smart and even hardworking, but they do poorly in school because they just won't do what they're told. Right? You know, so one of my best friends at uh, UC Berkeley in my first year was a brilliant computer programmer. Like he was already making lots of money uh, like over the internet, just giving away free software and asking people to volunteer to send him money. And yet he failed out. And how did he fail out? He failed peace and conflict studies, which is a class where I think you get a C for just saying, how does war make you feel? You know, bad, right? And fill up the page with that and that'll get you a C. And like, how did he fail? Brilliant guy. He refused to go to the test, right? And like, why? He says, well, you know, well Brian, I, don't, I didn't think it was a good class, so I didn't go. It's like, all right, well, then you're going to fail, right? And then 
Uh, you know, he still did fine, but uh, <laughs> but uh, it was it was much harder for him to succeed because he did not have those credentials. All right, so the key assumptions in signaling models are as follows. Uh, first of all, you need to have some hard to observe hard to observe differences between people. You can't just be able to look at a person and say good worker, bad worker, good worker, bad worker. Right, so it can't be that easy. If it's that easy, then there's no reason to signal. People just know, look at you, size you up, and that's the end of it. Instead, it needs to be difficult to figure out who's good and who's bad, right? Which is likely to be true, especially when there's big rewards for pretending to be good even when you're not, right? So when you're in an interview and they ask you, what is your greatest personal weakness? Uh, there are two standard answers that you want to give, right? So... Let's see, you know, there's, uh, you know, so the first one is workaholic. You know, what, you know what's wrong with me? I'm a workaholic. Oh, I just can't focus on anything other than my work. All right, so that's a good way to get a job. Or there's also perfectionist. It's a good one. Say, oh, I mean, I just don't rest until my work is perfect. That's my problem. All right, so anyway, these are answers. And you know, once you realize that people are fishing for these kinds of answers, people are very inclined to give such answers, whether they are true or not. And therefore, it is hard to figure out who's actually sincere. Uh, there was an old Simpsons episode where, where uh, there were three people interview interviewing for a job, and they were asked the greatest weakness question, and one said workaholic, another one said perfectionist, and then Homer Simpson said, well, you know, I'm lazy, I get angry, and just leave the scene of accidents a lot. All right, so Homer was so bad, he didn't, he didn't even know what lies he was supposed to be telling, but you know, the other guys did. All right, so you need to have some hard to observe differences. Then, then next, the differences have to correlate with something that is easy to observe, like grades or diplomas. So people who are smart, hardworking, and conformist tend to do better in school. It doesn't need to be an absolute rule, it just needs to be a tendency. Then people can say, all right, fine, well, I can't really tell if you're a good worker, but I can do something a lot easier and just take a look at your academic record and then figure that if you have a good record, then you're probably going to be a good worker too. You know, and you say, well, that's not certain proof, but running a business, you're not trying to prove anything. You're just trying to make a good enough decision to get by, right? You know, so business is not logic. Business is more like surfing, where you're just trying to stay on the board, right, and hope you don't wipe out. All right, and then finally, it needs to be the case that higher productivity workers, people who actually will contribute more to a business, need to have lower costs of doing the observable thing. So need to have lower costs of doing the observable thing, which could be lower cost in money, right? Now, you might say, well, like, do better students actually pay less money to get their education? Actually, even, even in the simplest way they do, because better students uh, often will get merit scholarships, that kind of thing. But more importantly, better students pay less for their education because better students finish early, and they finish on time. Right? So if you want to look at odds of finishing in four years, if you did really well in high school, you're a lot more likely to finish in four years than, uh, than if you were do doing poorly in high school, which means that better students generally are only going to be paying four years of tuition instead of five or six. So in that way, for better students, education is just financially cheaper. This is also a matter of time. So if you are a better student, then you are going to be able to get good grades with less effort because the material is easier for you. Right? And then, of course, there's just pain. Right, so just think about what is it like to be a C student in high school? How miserable is that? Even if you're getting through, still every day you're getting back work, someone with a C on it, or you know, like people saying, well, needs improvement. How many times do you need to hear the phrase needs improvement before it is depressing? It's like, yeah, well, what is that a euphemism for? Needs improvement. I've been needing improvement for the last 12 years straight. You know, it's, it's discouraging, right? So, I mean, like, even if you knew there was a bag of money waiting for you at the end, if you would just endure the endless litany of needs improvement, a lot of people would just say, look, I'm tired of being told I need to improve. I'm like the way I am right now. All right. Now, in these signaling models, key point, the market rewards people who show their stuff, even if the display is intrinsically totally wasteful. You can be rewarded for doing well in Aristotle. Why? Because even though the job won't use anything that you learn in Aristotelian philosophy, still, the fact that you did well at that shows something about you. It persuades employers that you are a good gamble and therefore makes it more likely that you will actually get a good job that makes good money. Okay. Now, why should you believe anything I'm telling you? All right. Why should you believe anything that I'm telling you? Say the strongest re reason to believe in the power of signaling is simply to look at curricula. Look at what students have to actually study. How do students spend their time? Right? Of course, you don't even have to look at the numbers. You can remember what you were doing throughout your, your entire education. Or how about this current semester? 
Just go through your classes. How many of those classes do you think you're going to be using later on? If you're in CS, maybe a lot of them. Even there, I found when I talk to people in CS, they say, hey, you're really overestimating us. A lot of it is CS theory, which you don't use except unless you're a CS professor. But anyway, so in the US, we're just starting with high school. So only 30% of high school course hours are spent on English and math. Over 40% on arts, foreign language, history, social studies, subjects that again very rarely come up in the real world. Right? You can also take a look at patterns for US college majors. You know, only or less than 25% of college students have what I call a credibly vocational major. Something like you know, engineering or computer science or nursing or, or like agricultural science. Something where at least you can believe that you're being prepared for future careers. Okay. And you know, you know, so you know, like less than 25% are in these. And you know, like economists often say, what about all those engineers? Like all those engineers, it's like 5% of students. Right, so it may be a prominent major, where it's actually you know, 5% of graduates, not even 5% of students, 5% of graduates. Like why not like, like have degrees in engineering? Right? And you're like, why, how can there be so few? Well, I'll tell you, because engineering is a lot of work. Right? You know, if you're an engineer, you don't really get to go to college, do you? Right? You have to actually, you're actually going and spending your time in school studying. Whereas if you're doing, say, economics, then you're doing your 25, 25 hours a week for 30 weeks a year, which leaves time for all of the pleasures of college. Right? All right. Now, what if we go and look at what people actually know? Now, here there are two different ways that you can measure learning. There is the easy bad way and there is the hard good way. The easy bad way of measuring learning is to give someone a, a test at the end of the year or at the end of their academic program. That's easy because the students are right there. You control their schedules. You say, today is the test. Sit down. Here's your test. And you get the scores. Why is it bad? It's bad because people forget stuff and not just a little bit. People forget most of what they learn quickly unless they actually use it. Right? So uh, Tiger Mom Amy Chua has a great line of one of, her, one of her books. She says that every day you don't practice is a day you get worse. Right? So think about, say, whatever foreign language that you took in high school. Like you probably haven't been doing it for a while. How much have you lost in just this short amount of time? Right, compared to how well you could have you did it on the day the final exam of the last year of that language when you might have been okay. All right. So now why is this a bad way of doing it? Well, because employers presumably don't want to pay you for what you used to be able to do. They want to pay you for what you can do today. Right? Why would any employer say, you know, I want to find a bunch of people who used to be good at stuff and hire them? It's like, hmm, how about we find people who, could, who actually are currently able to do it? That sounds like a much better employment strategy, does it not? All right, so that's why I tried to go and find measures of adult knowledge, which is a lot harder to do because making adults take a test is a lot of work, right? But on the other hand, when you get those test results, it is relevant to the question at hand, which is why is it that education actually pays? All right, so uh, there's fewer, fewer such tests of adults, but I was able to track down a good number, and that is a major part of the book. So here's what I can tell you. In the US, researchers who, researchers who measure adult literacy and num numeracy find the results are disappointing. You know, most people do know how to read and write and do basic math. There's about a third of adult Americans who are quite iffy, actually, right, where the literacy and numeracy is quite weak despite all those years in school. Right? And then when we move over to the other subjects that are taught in school, you know, civics, history, science, foreign languages, for all these areas, researchers find a level of knowledge that is barely different from no, no knowledge at all. You know, a good rule of thumb is this. Imagine writing down the easiest conceivable science test. All right, so true, false, with questions like, which is bigger, the Earth or the Moon? All right, really easy questions. You know, like, you know, like, does the Earth go around the Sun or the Sun go around the Earth? That's a real question, by the way, a real question on one of the biggest tests. All right. So step one is you and write the easiest imaginable test and then give it to a random sample of adult Americans and on average they'll get about half right. They get about half right. So there's adjusting for guessing. All right, so you get half right if you knew nothing, if it's just true or false. But, you know, so adjusting for guessing. So they finally get about half right and then you say, well, it's not so bad. I say that's terrible. That's terrible. You know, so think about this. If you know half the letters in the alphabet, what are you? Are you half literate if you know half the letters in the alphabet? No, you are illiterate if you know half the letters in the alphabet because you cannot read at all if you only know half the letters in the alphabet. Similarly, I say if you don't even know which party controls the Senate in the US, you don't understand US politics at all 
you don't have a clue about what's going on if you lack even these very most basic pieces of knowledge. All right, so anyway, for all these areas, we do find these shockingly low scores. Uh, now, usually when confronted with these very dire facts, people who want to defend the system said, all right, well, look, all right, fine, we spend many years going studying foreign languages, and we don't speak foreign languages at all, really. We spend all these years studying science, we don't really know any science. On and on. All right, fine, but it's fine, don't worry about the fact that it seems like you wasted all those years in school, because while you were failing to learn this other stuff, or during the, or like despite the fact that you've forgotten almost everything you've learned, something really great happened. And what's, what's that? You learned how to learn. School, you know, in school, you learned how to learn. So even though you don't remember anything we actually tested you on, you still have another skill that no one ever measures, that we don't actually explicitly even try to teach, but believe me, it happens on a massive scale, and you owe it all to us. All right, so this is a popular story. I mean, what's funny to me is most economists hold psychologists in low regard. I love psychologists. I think they're great, and like, when I'd rather read psychology articles than articles in economics at this point in my life. All right, but anyway, um, when I was in grad school, I knew a lot of economists who couldn't even say the word psychology without sneering. And they say, well, if you want to go and read psychology, all right, all right, yeah, like why should we read the pe anything by the people who study what people believe and think and feel? That's stupid. All right, anyway, so I get a lot of out of it. All right, but anyway, so what's striking to me is there's a lot of economists who otherwise would never even talk about psychology when you point out that students are not, or like, or people, adults don't remember much of what they learned in school. They say, ah, well, don't worry about it. People learn how to learn. Yeah, well, you know, there might be some people who have spent their entire lives studying this subject who could have something to teach us about this. And indeed, there is a whole field called educational psychology. And they have spent about the last hundred years trying to measure learning how to learn. And uh, you can read, go, you know, go into the book for a more uh, thorough description of it. But a very fair summary of what they conclude is this. Learning how to learn is mostly wishful thinking. We see almost no evidence that it really happens. If a teacher does a good job and you are lucky, the students learn the specific material you teach them. If you fail at that, you don't succeed at much of anything. Right? And you know, is that depressing? Yeah, it's kind of depressing, but uh, you got to face facts. All right, now, uh, we've got all of this useless education, but what about the actual financial payoffs? As I said, you know, the ubiquity of useless education would not be puzzling if the market rewarded education poorly. If you went and studied a bunch of useless subjects, applied for a job, and the employers laughed in your face and said, Latin? That's stupid. We don't need Latin. Next. Right, if that was the normal reaction of employers to your transcript, then it wouldn't be that puzzling what's going on. And you say, all right, well, it's just like another dysfunctional bureaucracy, teaching students a bunch of stuff they don't need to know. Employers respond accordingly and say, we don't need a bunch of stuff that you don't need to know. See you later. All right, but that's not what's going on. At least, so at least, in, the, at least in the US, the market rewards education very well, right? Which, uh, if you're a student, this is pretty good news for you. So you know, if, if you're listening to this and thinking you're going to drop out, you know, like, you know, think again. Right, because like, even if what you were studying seems totally irrelevant, you could be completely right about the irrelevance, and yet wrong to think that it will not open a lot of doors for you and give you a better job and more money. Okay, all right, so market rewards education very, very well. Now, if you're more sophisticated, you may say, fine, well, we shouldn't just go and look at the average earnings of college graduates compared to the average earnings of people who only went to high school and assume that all of the difference is caused by education, and that's right. Uh, but when people go and make all of the adjustments they can think of to try to get a more realistic picture of how financially helpful ed education is, they still walk away with a quite favorable verdict. All right, so the market rewards education very well. This remains true you know, after making an array of adjustments, a many adjustments. All right, so like what kind of adjustments would you want to make? Well, an obvious one is people that finished college are likely to have been better high school students. Totally true. So in order to figure out how well does college actually, or how much does college actually help you, you want to compare two people with the same high school record, but one finished college and one didn't, and then see that. So that's one thing that you might want to do. You might want to go and see, well, maybe people who uh, finish college come from richer families, and the richer families go and help them get better jobs. And their future families could have helped them do that even if they hadn't gone to college. So let's go and make an adjustment for that. And so on. All right. 
And you can go and make all these adjustments, and even after doing all of this, uh, the payoff for finishing degrees looks quite good. The main thing to keep in mind, actually, when you're trying to figure out whether or not your education is actually going to be financially profitable for you, is whether you finish. Because there is a high failure rate. And as we're going to see, most of the payoff for education comes from finishing. Most of the payoff comes from finishing. So if you're not likely to finish, then that's the main reason to be skeptical about the benefits, not because the benefits aren't there if you finish, but because you're not likely to actually reach that finish line. All right. So and if you have more questions about that, of course, we can cover that in the Q&A. All right. So uh, here's what's nice about signaling. It elegantly reconciles two totally different bodies of research from very different fields. So you've got economists going and studying the financial payoffs of education. So they're studying the effect of education on earning. Then you've got people in psychology and education, uh, you know, especially studying uh, the actual effect of education on learning. And they're finding these extremely disappointing results. And then like, how can both sides be right? right? And the answer is, well, th it's very easy. The economists correctly describe the effect of education on earning. And the psychologists and education researchers are correctly describing the effect of education on learning. And both can be and are correct. All right. Now, just to give you, uh, you, know, give you a bit more background, all right, so in case you're not convinced, uh, you might be signaling if. All right, so these are all arguments that uh, should be immediately accessible from your own firsthand experience. Uh, of course, if they're not, then they fall flat. All right, uh, first point. Uh, you might be signaling if you bother to enroll or pay tuition. All right. Uh, so suppose that you think that uh, Princeton is the best university in the world. All right, maybe it's not, but suppose you do. All right, uh, here is how you can go there without enrolling and without paying it to Princeton any money. Just go and get a bus ticket and move to Princeton and then start attending classes. The end. This is totally doable. I have been there. No one will card you. No one will say, hey, are you really a Princeton student here? Show me your ID. Get out. There's no passcode you know, pass on the doors for the classrooms. Anyone who wants can move to Princeton and get a Princeton education. If you're compulsively honest, you might go up to the professor and say, I mean, I'm not really a student here, but would you mind if I sat in on your class? And I can tell you, like, the normal reaction from almost any professor is first, you know, stunned silence, and then a little tear comes down their other cheeks. Says, you mean you want to learn what I have to teach? This has never happened in all my years. So glorious day. All right, that's the normal thing that would have the professors do. Right? Like, you know, like someone wants to study my subject for no, just, just, just because? Weird. All right. So, and compare this to MSU where you're, oh, you had to enroll, had to go through all the bureaucracy, you're paying tuition probably. Right? And you could be at Princeton right now. Right? You know, there's living expenses there, but there's living expenses here. So why not do it? Well, there's just one little tiny thing that you won't have from Princeton at the end of your four years of free Princeton education. And that's a diploma. There will be no record you were ever there. All right, now, which would you rather have? The, uh, the Princeton education without the diploma or the diploma without the education? All right, now I'll say, well, even if you think about it for a bit, you, you must agree with me. Right? Even to, even to say, hmm, interesting question. Well, you've proven my point because at least you are admitting that signaling is important. Right? So if it's at the point where you have to actually wonder like, which is better, one piece of paper or four years of learning, then you have already admitted that signaling is a very big deal indeed. Right? So whenever people say, oh my god, college is so expensive, no, it's free. What's, what you pay for is official, re official acknowledgement that you were there. That's what you pay for. Right? And apparently almost no one on earth wants the free education by itself. They want the actual signal. Interesting. All right. Uh, you might be signaling if you worry about failing the final exam but not subsequently forgetting what you learned. Yeah, so think about how many times you've done a final exam for a class and then you've never thought about the subject again for as long as you lived. Right? He's like, okay, now the final exam's over. Now I can relax. Now I can let all the knowledge drain from my brain. And if someone says, oh, but aren't you worried you'll need to know it? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you know, fat chance of that. No, not very likely. All right, so you worry about failing that final exam, 
but not subsequently forgetting what you learned. If the reason why you, uh, schooling pays is that you're learning useful skills, failing and forgetting should have exactly the same effect upon your career. On the other hand, if, you were, if the reason why education pays is that you were convincing employers that you are capable of, of learning and mastering material, that you are trainable, then the fact that you learned a bunch of things decades ago still looks good. It still is convincing. You say, well, look, this guy has learned a bunch of other dumb stuff before, so he can learn whatever we want to teach him too. Right? And you say, yeah, but he doesn't know that stuff. Well, that's fine because we don't actually use that stuff any anyway. But, you know, like if you could go and master Latin, I think you're going to be able to figure out how to figure out how to fill out the paperwork at this office. So that's why there'd be a difference. Uh, another reason you might be signaling if. You don't think cheating is only cheating yourself. If the only reason you're here in school is to acquire skills, there's no reason to prevent cheating. Because the, what does the cheater do? They pay the school money, they sit in class, waste time, and then they don't actually learn the material, and employers will see right through you. They'll say, hey, that person doesn't actually know anything, and therefore I won't pay the person for that. Right. So that's if the only reason you're here is to get skills. On the other hand, if you are here to get a stamp on your forehead, a seal of approval, then cheating doesn't just hurt the cheater. In that case, the cheater is hurting two other groups of people. Then the cheater is hurting employers because what does a cheater do? You impersonate a good worker. You go and pretend to be a good worker, which means that you are more likely to get hired for those jobs, and then the employer will be disappointed with the outcome. So if you are cheating and the reason, and at least part of the reason why you're doing it is to impress employers, then you're cheating the people who thought they were getting somebody good who actually, don't, who actually do not get somebody good. And of course, the cheater also cheats the fellow students, the fellow students who were actually putting in the work because the cheater devalues the degree. The cheater dilutes the value of the education. You know, you don't want to go to a school where the common reputation is it's all a bunch of cheaters there. Even the cheaters don't want to go to that school. Cheaters want to be the one cheater to school where that, uh, with a reputation for impeccable honesty so that everybody there, every, uh, every employer says, oh, well, if you got a degree from there, you must be great because I've never heard of any problem with cheating there. And you're like, yeah, that's right. I'm the only one. All right. <laughs> you don't need to know. All right. Uh, you might be signaling if you seek out easy A's, right? If you go and look around for a professor who will give you an A for very little work, that is another sign that you are signaling. Why? Because you know, if the main reason you're in school here is to go acquire skills, then it's a bad idea to go to those easy professors who don't ask very much of you. Sure, you get the A, but what do you walk away with? You know, they ask very little of you, and you walk away with very little. Uh, that's if it's about the skills. But if it is about the signal, then this is great, because do employers know who the easy professors at MSU are? Do you have easy professors here? I'm suspecting you do have some that are known to be easy. They don't, if they don't know who the easy ones are and you get the easy ones, that is a fantastic deal for you because you get the market reward of, a, of taking a hard, a hard professor in exchange for the work of doing an easy one, which is a sweet deal. On the website, ratemyprofessors.com, at least they used to have a rating for easiness where more easiness is good. There's no rating for like teaches lots of useful job skills. Right? So no one is grading them for that. Yeah, so, so remember my dad, was, uh, when he was an engineer at UCLA, he said there was one required class, and there was one teacher, one professor whose standards were so high that like, only, he'd only give out a few Cs, and then the rest Ds and Fs. And so what my dad said is no students would even sign up for his class. And then finally, the uh, university came up with a system. They said, well, since no one will sign up for his class and it's a required class, let's go and remove the name from the student handbook and just say it's taught by staff. And so then people would go and sign up, and then they would sit there and wait to see who walked into the room to teach on the first day of class. And then when that guy walked in, my dad said, you know, two-thirds of the class would just walk out as soon as he walked in. All right, and, and it wasn't because the guy didn't teach useful engineering skills. It was because he wouldn't give any grade higher than a C. All right, so if you seek out easy A's. Now, notice the difference here. Though, like, you still might want to do a hard major because employers can say very easily, well, like, I think a math major is a lot harder than a communications major. Right? But it's within those categories. Like They don't know who the easy math teachers are, but they do have an idea that math is generally harder than communications. And another, ex another case. You might be signaling if you rejoice when teachers cancel class. If a professor says, hey, you know what? Uh, class is canceled. Yeah, I canceled class to be here, actually. Right? And did my students go, how dare you cancel class? We paid good money for education, and we want every minute of that education. We're entitled to it. Don't rip us off. 
No, not a normal reaction. Instead, the normal reaction is, yay, all right, we paid you money and we get nothing in exchange, yay. All right, <laughs> a weird reaction if you're there for the skills, but a very sensible reaction if you are there for the seal of approval, because again, like does your transcript say how many classes the compressor canceled? No, so it's a nice way of getting the same reward in exchange for less work. All right, uh, oh, excuse me, yes. All right, so now what exactly is so bad about signaling? Who cares if education builds human capital, if it actually gives you skill that you otherwise would not have, or if it just signals it? What possible difference does it make? What possible difference does it make? All right, and my answer is this. Uh, signaling models imply that education has what economists call negative externalities. All right, this is a complicated phrase for a very simple concept. Uh, so suppose that you're all at a concert, you're all sitting down, and you individually want to see better. What can one individual do in order to see better at a concert? Stand up. You, one person stands up at a concert, that one individual sees better. Therefore, it follows, as night does day, that if everybody stands up, everybody sees better, right? Wrong. If everybody stands up, then nobody sees better, and instead you all have sore feet. And that is the accomplishment of standing up. All right, so this is a general point where the effects for an individual and the effects for society can be extremely different. All right, so if my story is right, I'm not saying that education is not financially profitable for individuals. In fact, quite the opposite. You know, if you looked and saw that people more education didn't make more money, I'd be wrong. My story would be completely wrong if people did not make more money as a result of getting more education. Rather, what my story says is that education enriches individuals but impoverishes society. It makes the individual who does it more rich, but makes the society that does it less rich. All right. And again, this is the idea of the negative externality. When you go and get more education, you're making yourself look good by making others look bad. You're making other people look bad by comparison. Of course, for one person, this is only a small effect, but when there's a whole lot of people doing it, then it's enormous. All right, now how would we be able to tell if this was going on? Uh, well, the best sign of it is if we look at society as education rises and see that there is what researchers call credential inflation. Credential inflation. What is credential inflation? It means that you need more education to get the very same job that your parents or grandparents got with less. So again, it's not credential inflation if your dad was a janitor and you're a computer programmer and you need a degree to, to be a programmer and he didn't to be a janitor. That's just you're working in a totally different occupation. But if you need more education to be a janitor than your grandfather de, to be, did to be a janitor, that is a sign of credential inflation. All right, so there's been quite a bit of study of this credential inflation, a lot of it done by sociologists. Right, and again, economists have problems with sociologists. I don't, I love reading sociology. All right, but anyway, so they've you know, put a lot of work into this, trying to, trying to measure it, and here's the punchline. There has been a massive credential inflation over the last 40 years and probably for as long as we've got data, going back 100 years. And what does this mean? It means that right now there are a lot of jobs where you need a college degree that, used to be, that you could previously get with a high school degree. So for example, now it would be very common for a secretary to have a college degree. Yeah, when my mom first started working as a secretary in the Air Force in Japan in 1949 or so, do you think secretaries needed college degrees back then? No way. All right, so I don't think you even need, really needed high school back then, so she had finished high school, but, you know, so there's a job where before you didn't even need to finish high school, now you need a college degree to get it, right? And, again, then we can see the same thing in a wide range of jobs, right? So, you know, like to be, for example, a waiter in a nice restaurant, 50 years ago, it would have seemed crazy that, we, that you would need a college degree to be a waiter at a nice restaurant, or even the restaurants would care. It's like, all right, college boy, who cares? Right now, there are plenty of nice restaurants where this is at least something that they put some weight on. When they're deciding who to go and give an interview to, well, we got a bunch of college applicants here, so why don't we go and favor them for, uh, for, uh, in order to be waiters? Right? You know, decades earlier, it would have been crazy to think that you'd need this. Right? Or you know, taxi drivers, Uber drivers, you know, do you really need a college degree to drive an Uber? Sounds pretty crazy. And yet, uh, it does seem that for most of these jobs, there actually is a payoff for having more education, even when it, you know, the education appears completely irrelevant to the job. All right, so of course, it's easy just to think of examples, but what the researchers do is try to take a look at the whole economy and just understand, so what's been going on over the last 40 or 50 years? 
How, like, has there really been a huge shift from low skill jobs to high skill jobs? And the answer is no. There's been a, a modest shift from lower skill jobs to high skill jobs. But a much bigger effect is simply that to get one in the same job that your parents or grandparents got with much less education, you now need more. And what is the point of that? What is the point of that? Right, so you know, it's very common for people to look back at an earlier period and say, oh, we're so much more enlightened than, they, than people were back then. You know, back in the 1950s, rich kids, uh, you know, really rich, you know, school at college was mostly for rich kids, kids from poor families would have had trouble going to college. Yeah, that may very well be true, but here's something better about the 50s. In the 50s, you didn't need college to get a good job. Wouldn't it be nice if you could get a good job without college? Imagine one world is college, is, uh, college is accessible to everyone, but you can't get a good job without college. The other one is where only rich people go to college, but you can get the job you want without college. Right? right? And again, you're saying, how could you be able to do the job without college? Well, uh, probably because most of what you actually need to know, you learn on the job. On the job training is where most actual training goes on. And the main point of your education is it's basically a passport to the real training. Education is a passport to the real training. You go and you spend four years in college and then finally say, okay, well now we can train you as a secretary. <coughs> you seem ready now. Before, you didn't need the passport to travel to the world of the secretary. All right, so that is my story. All right, now, if I'm right about this, right, and of course, if you are only semi-convinced, then you can read the book, or if you're totally unconvinced, or like, you know, you can read the book in any case, but all right. So here is the big policy implication that I push in the book, right? And by the way, I found that there are a lot of people who agree with basically every word I've said until now. So we got like 47 minutes of agreement, followed by 13 minutes of no, no, no. <coughs> All right, but uh, I think the 13 minutes are, are also good. And do follow from the previous 47 minutes. All right, so the major policy implication, the big thing that I push in the book is this. Drastically cut education spending. Less education. End it sooner. Spend less on it. Fewer requirements. Fewer classes. Fewer people going. All of these things. Uh, in a word, austerity. Educational austerity. Uh, now this word austerity is usually considered a, used negatively. It's like the horrible 10 years of austerity policies in Europe. Anyway, but this is a word that accurately describes what I, what, what I believe in which is taking a close look at taxpayer money and seeing whether it's actually being well spent, right? So, I mean, you know, like to me, austerity is basically like going to your dad and saying, hey, dad, I need 50 bucks. And if your dad is anything like my dad, the next question is, what do you need it for? What do you need the 50 bucks for? And then it's like, well, I knew that. Well, wait, didn't I just give you 50 bucks last week? What happened to that 50 bucks? It's like, well, and like, when, like, what came of it? I want to know. Show me what you actually accomplished the last 50 bucks. Then maybe we'll talk. I'm like, fine, Dad, I'll just go ask Mom. All right, so anyway, that to me is what austerity is all about. And again, when you are spending taxpayer money, this seems to be a totally reasonable and I would say completely non-ideological position. Say, like, when you're spending taxpayer money, ask questions about what is it, what are you using it for, what will you accomplish with it, and what is the evidence that the last money that we spent actually, actually achieved the kind of things that you were claiming it will accomplish. All right. Now, most people, when they read the book, just say, no, no, no. We shouldn't cut a dime. We should just go and improve it. Let's just make education better. Let's make education better. Let's not talk about cutting anything. And you know, here, here is why I say that the austerity approach is much better. Uh, this. Cutting is really easy. Every dummy knows how to cut spending. You know, like just spend less. Just do it. There's a thousand different ways of doing it. It's very easy. On the other hand, meaningful reform is very hard. Meaningful reform is very hard. Are there ways that we could go and spend our education dollars to get better and more learning out of it? I'm convinced there are. Uh, however, uh, the research on this has been around for decades, and yet schools generally don't do what the research says. So therefore, I do not trust schools to do it, right? Uh, in the same way that if you're paying someone to mow your lawn for a year and you come back and you find your lawn was not mowed at all, and you say, hey, I paid you for a whole year and you didn't mow my lawn, and the guy says, okay, all right, you caught me, but uh, from now on, I will mow your lawn and just keep the money coming. It's like, no, the money will not keep coming. How about you go and start doing the job, convince me that you are making it work, and then I will reconsider hiring you back. And otherwise, too bad. 
right? And this is my view about education spending. First, they should fix things. First, they should actually successfully teach a high level of useful skills. And then, once they're doing that, then we can consider restoring the funding, right? Until then, just be suspicious. And why be suspicious? Because the best predictor of future performance is past performance, right? And again, what are some educational techniques that actually do improve learning verifiably? Like here's a really simple one, a weekly quiz. Weekly quiz, right? Very good evidence that just gives students a weekly quiz and that will improve their learning. But it's not done that often because it's a pain in the neck and it's work for the teacher and the students complain, so not done very much. You know, like you say, the evidence is solid, but schools aren't doing it. So like, well, if you really want the money, maybe you should start doing stuff like that and see what happens. All right, um, now another analogy to like here, which is gross, but I like it anyway, uh, is imagine you've got toenail fungus, which is almost incurable actually. All right, and then your friend comes and says, you know that stuff that you spend 100 bucks on a month trying to cure your, your toenail fungus? Here's a bunch of uh, scientific papers showing that that stuff doesn't work at all. And then your reaction is, well, what does work? And your friend says, I don't know, maybe nothing. And you say, well, look, until I actually have a new effective treatment in hand, I'm gonna keep spending $100 a month on this stuff. Right? That is crazy. That is crazy. Look, I have shown you that you are wasting your money. That is sufficient to stop wasting the money. It's, and, that, and, look, and then maybe there's, you can go and find a way of, of uh, a more effective way of spending the money to cure the toenail fungus. Maybe not. But step one is stop wasting the money on something that doesn't work, and then conduct an open-minded, thorough, and laborious search for something better to spend it on, and maybe at the end you'll say, yeah. I'll just go to Florida another time per year and I won't worry about this problem. All right, so that is the big thing that I push. It's obviously extremely unpopular. But again, uh, when people say, but like, shouldn't we be very concerned about making sure that everybody can go? And I said, look, it's because we have done such a good job of making sure that people can go that it's so hard to get a good job without a college degree now. Again, my dream world is one where you can get a good job without college. And we used to have this world and we can have it again. The cost though is that you've got to create a world where college is hard to get into again. All right, or a way that I often uh, you know, put this to my students is if people listen to me, a lot of you could, wouldn't be here anymore. That's the bad news. And it's really bad news for me, but I'm telling you anyway. But here's the good news. You wouldn't need to be here anymore, right? Employers would no longer hold it against you that you don't have a college degree if it's down, once again down to only 10% of the population has it, right? Then there are so many jobs that currently you need to get and need a college in order to get them where employers would relax their standards in order to actually fill the slots. All right, uh, now, the uh, minor policy implication is to make education much more vocational. To make education much more vocational. Uh, so here again, there's, you know, like, like there's quite a bit of research on this. Most of it just focuses on the effects on the individual student. And the main punchline is that it's at least moderately better for the individual student, right? So the typical student right now at least should be doing more vocational education and less academic education. So if you were to go and uh, you know, like, and basically do one more vocational education per a class per semester in high school and one less academic class. This looks like it would be on, on balance, be better even for your own career. But again, the main reason I'm pushing it is not that it's better for the individual student, but rather that it's better for society to train people to do actual useful things than to go and teach them Latin, right? And it pays better for the real world, so only moderately better for the student, but vastly better for taxpayers. Right now, a common reaction to all of this is just the ad, hom ad hominem argument of, well, Brian, are you, well, you wouldn't send your kids to vocational education. Yeah, I just got this from an education professor a couple days ago. Well, you wouldn't send your kids there. And I say, well, I mean, I wouldn't send my older kids there because they're doing really well in academics. So that, that means that statistically we should expect them to do really well in college. But my younger kids, I don't know how well they're gonna do in academics. So if they were C students in high school, I would definitely tell them we should go and look at vocational education as a better option for you. Because if you're struggling with academics, then we shouldn't expect that you're gonna do well in college. And if you don't do well in college, you probably won't finish. So it's just going to be a poor use of your time. And therefore, we need to find something else that you like and are good at. And there are a great many such occupations out there. You know, like electrician, plumber, construction. These are all ones where they don't teach it in school and yet actually uh, you know, like it pays well. And people that don't like school, right? Do you remember all those kids that have gone, went to school with you who don't like school? Remember how they exist? Yeah, academics tend to forget that kids who don't like school even exist. But there are, they are numerous. They are, there are numerous bored faces. Even some college students don't like school, shockingly. You know, there are some college students who don't go show up at every class, uh, hard as it is to believe. But in any case, 
So for kids like that, it really does make a lot more sense to offer them vocational options and to encourage them to do that. And again, if you think there's any point in having course re required classes of any kind, then why not have required vocational education? Now, usually when you start bringing this up, people jump to, a to multiple different absurd caricatures. So I remember one of the referee reports of the book said, oh, what kind of voca vocational education? Like typewriter repairman? Like, no, not typewriter repairman. All right, so yes, there are some occupations that you might have been trained for that are no longer useful. Therefore, there's no point training anybody for anything. I had no idea what the point of this argument was. So yes, it's true that some things we train people for, it's going to turn out they're not very useful. But nevertheless, it's best to go and make your best guess and try. You know, you know, right now, uh, education prepares people for jobs like poet and historian, right? You know, professional mathematician. You know, these are jobs that we know with near certainty are not going to be big in the future. You know, whatever the internet does to the US economy, I think it's fair to say that the internet will not turn poetry into a common field, right? Uh, anyone think that's gonna happen? Pro probably not. All right, another caricature that people have about vocational education is, so it's gonna be just like Germany where you take a test when you're 14 and then if, you don't, if you're one point short, then that's it for you and then, you're, then you have to be a metal worker your whole life. It's like, that's actually not how the German system works at all. Uh, the German system, if you don't get a high enough score, you still have the option to do academic education. They just give you a recommendation. And furthermore, there are choices about which kind of particular vocation you wanna learn. Right? And if you're concerned about shunting kids into one occupation at too early of an age, here is a very simple alternative to that. How about you just start the vocational education even earlier and expose people to numerous different occupations? Right? So you could start it when they're 12, and you say, well, we're gonna next, uh, the next 40 weeks, we're going to do two weeks each on 20 different occupations. Right? 20 different occupations that are actually statistically likely to turn into something for you, and we'll see whether any of those 20 occupations appeals to you. Right? So if we were focusing on preparing people for adult life rather than for pipe dreams, this is what we would do. All right. Uh, now, you know, last point before I turn over questions. Uh, probably the most common single reaction in my book is, look, fine, like, like maybe everything you're saying is right, but you're an economist and here's what economists don't understand. There's more to school than job training. In fact, some people said, look, the point of school is not job training at all. All right. Uh, now, partly when I hear this, I'd say, well, maybe you should go and tell taxpayers that very clearly. Maybe taxpayers should be clearly alerted to this admission that the point of this is not to actually prepare people to be independent adults, and rather it's to go and just teach them a lot of cultural stuff and see if people are still as interested in funding it. Right, but in any case, uh, you know, so, you know, but, you know, that aside, well, I say, look, I'm actually well aware of that, and I do have a whole chapter on this in the book. And here's what I say about all of the non-career effects of education. We shouldn't just take people at their word for saying that school accomplishes these things. We should measure it. So for example, if schools say, look, the whole point of education is not really about preparing people for jobs, it's to teach appreciation of great literature. All right, great. Let us go and measure the level of appreciation of adult literature among people with different levels of education and see how successful you were at instilling love of, this, uh, of, of literature. Right? And I actually do this in the book as well. So for example, we can go and take a look at how many books do Americans voluntarily read for pleasure anyway? Right? And it's actually a very unpopular hobby. <laughs> right? And then how about like high culture? Like how many Americans voluntarily experience Shakespeare in a given year? You know, it's a vanishingly small share. So what I'll say here is look, like if schools really taught Shakespeare to love it, to live and breathe Shakespeare, if as a result of high school Shakespeare, we had a whole country of people going around quoting King Lear saying, nothing comes of nothing. If that were what we accomplished, then I think this would be an interesting argument. And I might even be sympathetic, I might be even a bit sympathetic. Yeah, that would be a great world if everyone went around quoting Shakespeare. However, right now, despite the fact that we go and ram a lot of Shakespeare down kids' throats, adults in America hardly ever voluntarily experience Shakespeare. You have failed to inspire love of Shakespeare. You know, what about like one in a hundred, one in a thousand, less? All right, look, if high school manages to turn one kid in a thousand into a Shakespeare lover, this is where I think we do have to say that is too high of a cost for such a meager gain. You know, and especially in the world of the internet where now anyone who wishes to enrich their soul can now do so at really zero cost all day, every day. If when I was in high school, I knew the internet was gonna happen, 
I would have sat around saying, oh God, I can't wait. It's going to be like Christmas in 20 years. It'll be so fantastic, right? And this is what we have. Now, of course, most people actually use the internet for Kim Kardashian rather than for learning Shakespeare. But what this shows is that the real problem is just apathy and it's not lack of exposure or that it's too costly, right? You know, which is disappointing, but still I'd say that it's best to go and be grateful for what we have. We do have a machine which provides an unlimited fire hose of culture for to, uh, the whole world practically for free. So if you really think that that is important, then rather than doubling down on an education system that barely actually enriches people, we can go and say, well, isn't it nice that we got another way of doing it that is free for anyone who wants to take advantage of the system? All right, so thank you very much, and happy to take questions now. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> okay, questions? First off, thank you very much, Professor Kaplan. My pleasure. Um, I think uh, I've heard you answer this question before, but maybe for the broader audience. I think one of the intuitive... Uh, or, or do you, you want to wait just 30 seconds for people sure. to file out? Everyone leaving must be totally convinced, right? <laughs> I think one of the intuitive arguments against your, your, uh, your book is that uh, when we take a look cross-sectionally across countries, mm -hmm. so for example, uh, notably Singapore, for mm -hmm. example, we do see a correlation between the countries which do best on something like PISA and mm -hmm. also the countries which seem to be doing best economically. Mm -hmm. So uh, what would be your response to mm -hmm. that? Because that, that's mm -hmm. that the, the intuition of that yes. is that education does pay off. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, there's two ways that you can go and measure uh, the, the education in different countries. One of them is by measure, just measuring it the way that we usually do domestically, which is just how many years of education do people in the country have. All right, so, if you go, uh, so you know, a big and shocking result, especially shocking to many of the researchers themselves, is if you go and look at the effect of just raising the number of years of education of a country on the wealth of that country, it seems to be very small, maybe zero. All right, and, then, you know, and this result is credible to me because the people that are working this area really want to find a big result, and they don't find it. All right, so if you just go and measure education the usual way of just the amount of time that you spend sitting in a classroom, that doesn't seem to be important for countries' uh, standard of living at all, really, or at least, at least very barely. Now, there's the other way is your way, and that's by going and looking at the actual test scores of the population. When you do it that way, then we do see that that seems to matter. All right. Now, uh, there's two ways you can think about this. So one of them is, well, this shows is not that education in general is good, but that successful education is good, and that most education is not successful. All right, so it's, you know, this is hardly a ringing endorsement of you know, like any actual existing, of like the actual way we're doing it. We could say, you know, we could really say, look, if we could make our education system work like Singapore's, then it would be worthwhile, even though it's not very worthwhile right now. So that's one possibility is to say that if the education system actually were successful, then it would be worthwhile. Right, but it just uh, just uh, isn't very successful. Uh, but another another thing you do is say, well, wait a second. What exactly are these tests testing, and is it plausible that people really are using the skills on the job? So again, like one of the most predictive tests for actually two of the most predictive tests for national or national income are uh, national you know national tests of math knowledge and national tests of science knowledge. Now, to me, this is puzzling because most jobs use little math and you know, especially very little higher math, and most jobs use zero science. So, like, why would these tests be so important if, in fact, the content of the test doesn't come up on the job very often? And, you know, here my view is probably most of what these tests are measuring is differences in intelligence between countries, which, again, doesn't mean that intelligence can't be changed. A lot of evidence that it can be changed. But, it, but it's much harder to change intelligence than it is to raise science scores. Science scores, you just go into, and sit down uh, with, with a strict teacher and who actually makes them learn it, and you make them learn a lot of science. On the other hand, for making people smarter, there is work on it, but it's a lot harder than just giving them a class. I mean, you, know, you could give them a class where you just coach them on an IQ test. That would work too, but that presumably is not really uh, what you want to what you want to do. Uh, let's see, other questions? Yes. Yep. So it may be a, a little bit narrow in scope, but I was curious as to what a policy of austerity would do for like academic research institutions in the hard <laughs> sciences or in like medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, so yeah, so you know, like, you know, in general, of course, it would be bad for research institutions, right? And you know, bad for me especially, 
right? So I'm at a research institution, this is not good for me, so I'm not going and pushing a policy that's going to personally benefit me. I do have some hope that if people really listen to me, there'll be some grateful donor that will save my job and say, you know, thank you, Brian, for saving me all this money, but anyway. Um, main thing I'd say is, you know, if you think that there are particular kinds of useful research, then the sensible thing to do is to take the money that you're saving on education in general and put it into that exact thing. So again, just like if you think that the good thing about the moon landing was that we got some useful products on it, how about we just go and take the money and put it into the products directly, right? So, I mean, you know, so again, like if you think the medical research is going to pay off really well, how about we go and cut it and take the edu education savings and put it into medical research? Or again, like personally, I'm a big fan of not giving money for research but giving prizes for success. So instead of saying I'm going to hand out a billion dollars to people that are trying to cure AIDS, I will say, how about we, how, we create a billion dollar prize for whoever does, in fact, cure it, right? So reward success rather than, rather than effort. But yeah, I mean, that, that would be an obvious one. I would say that, you know, like, you know there has been you know, you know, quite a bit of work on, like, to what extent do universities actually, uh, you know, like, does university research actually have econ economic payoffs? Once again, this is a result that researchers desperately want to find, but they found it a lot harder to find it than they, than they thought. Uh, you know, like one story is, well, probably most of it is totally useless, and then there's a few things that are worthwhile, but they just get lost in the shuffle. So, although even there, I think it's a little bit le less clear because, you know, like, you know, like, you know something like, you know, like, like CS. All right, so you go and you look at CS departments, and you say, look, you know, they're brilliant guys, and there's useful, you know, useful results of their work. But there's a question, yeah, but what would they be doing if they weren't professors? Probably still be working in CS. And is it possible they'd be doing something more useful in the private sector than they are as professors? To me, this is plausible because I know a lot of professors like to work in pure theory, which goes nowhere, and it's just interesting to other professors. Whereas when you go and do more applied research, you actually again get more applied results. So again, there's always the hope that you'll do something not applied and then it will turn into, into credible applications, which you know, occasionally you get lucky. But you know, like a general rule, if you want to do X, do X. Don't do Y and then hope that it causes X, right? So that's why I would say that I mean, like, at least, you know, the like, reason why you know, I'm skeptical about the benefits of university research is I just see so many talented people who have gotten sucked into their own passion projects and have sort of lost interest in ever coming up with anything that would be of useful to mankind. I mean, you know, so, I mean, I have, like, so many smart friends who, like, sit around reading, like, the, like, the history, like, like, literature of 15th century Spain. I'm like, wow, like, you were, like, a brilliant science major. Like, you could have been, worried, you know, like, doing all kinds of amazing things in, like, 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 CS or chemistry, but, like, instead you're going and, like, reading the lesser contemporaries of Cervantes, like, which I'm sure it seems to be fun for you, but is that a, you know, much of a contribution to mankind? It doesn't seem like it. All right. Uh, vocational training in the trades have seen a vast decline in the workforce over the past few decades. Mm -hmm. uh, I've personally worked from the age of 14 wow. and really am a big proponent of the trades uh, just due to my experience and also from guys like Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, with the rising cost of college and the declining in the value of a college degree, do you see the market shifting towards trades even without a push for policy? Not much. I mean, actually, so I mean, two things. It's actually not true that the the, uh, the average payoff for college is falling, right? The college for the payoff for college is is basically at its all time high right now. It may have stopped rising, and but you know, but I mean, basically, like, like you know, the difference in earnings between the average college grad and the average high school grad is about seventy. You know, like average college grad makes about seventy percent more. That's near the all time high anyway. And then in terms of you know, right, you know, college costs have risen, but not nearly as much as people think because most students do not pay less price. So like in terms of both the benefits and the costs, I, like, I think you know, like, you know, the benefits seem quite stable actually, and the costs have not changed, very, have changed less, risen less than people think. And then the other thing is that, you know, I think you know, like the prime time for, uh, for training people would actually be in you know, junior high and high school, and that's actually going away. Right, so I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten from vocational education teachers who say, you know, like I, I read your you know, read your book or I heard you on, heard you on the radio. Like I really like what you're saying. I'm the only vocational teacher left at my high school. When I retire, they're killing the program, and I'm the and I'm the only one who actually goes and pr gives any useful training to all the kids who hate school. And they say, and by the way, there's a whole ton of them, and like they're all my students, and like I'm there trying to teach them to be auto mechanics and you know, do something useful with their lives. 
And like for these kids, like there's no way they're gonna finish college. They're just not that personality type. And you know, like I don't really know what to tell them. So yeah, I think it'd be great if uh, like we went and took a lot of the money that we're spending on things you know, like, like foreign language education, which seemed to yield almost no benefit, and put it into this. But I mean, I don't see much. much I mean, actually, I'd say that the main the main trend is that is actually further downwards. You know, especially because there's such a college for all emphasis in the in the curriculum. I mean, really, like the, the No Child Left Behind Act. The basic theory of that is that every kid should be prepared for college, regardless of what is statistically likely for them. And again, you know, sort of the underlying rationale is there's no harm in preparing everyone to go to college because either you're going, in which case it's good, or you're not going, in which case you can always do something else instead. And my answer to that is there is harm because if someone makes you spend grades 7 through 12 on a totally unrealistic option and you fail totally at it, and then at the end they say, okay, now let's try something else, you're probably in no mood to try something else at that point. So I'd say that, you know, really, like, it's, like if there's a kid that is promising in the trades, it's best to get them trying at a young age and uh, like at a point where they have to be doing something that they don't want to do, so why not do something that they, that they may not be that excited about that at least is, is a likely prospect for them instead of something that really is just a big Hail Mary pass. So, you know, I, w I wish you're right. I mean, I, I wish that the system would write itself, but I see, you know, like, you know, given that uh, taxpayer money funds almost the whole education system, it's really hard for things to improve much without the way the taxpayers spend their money changing. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, so leisure is a normal good. A oh, pardon? Leisure is a normal good. Mm -hmm. um, and leisure is probably worth more when you're young than when you're mm -hmm. old. Uh, mm -hmm. And as a society, we've gotten richer. So aren't mm -hmm. we just properly buying leisure at the time where it's more mm -hmm. valuable? Yeah, so, yeah, great question. So, yes, the leisure experience of college. How great is that? Uh, a bunch of things to say. So, first of all, like, the four-year college student who's being supported by their parents is actually a minority of college students now. So, I don't think there's that much of leisure experience for all the kids who have to work their way through school, or they're doing it part-time, or they're, like, or, they, or, like, or they're, like, you know, racking up an enormous amount of debt to do it. So, I don't think that for them the leisure experience is all that great. And, you know, we're very much worth, worth keeping that in mind. The other thing to remember is always, so what would you be doing instead? So imagine that instead of being in college for four years, you were doing whatever job you were going to do after college right out of high school. So you could be having a lot of leisure then too, right? So you could be having leisure plus money. You know, leisure plus money is actually better in a lot of ways, uh, you may have heard, right? So I mean, like, the older you get, the more you'll feel like, wow, if only I could have the money that I have when I'm 47 and put that, give that money to me when I was 20, and then I would have the physical ability to enjoy the money, right? You know, like I could travel the world when my feet don't hurt, right? Uh, whereas, you know, the current system is not really that well set up. So anyway, so because the main thing I would say is also, like, suppose that you were to actually make this case explicit and go to taxpayers and say, I think we should go and give all young people four years of camp and paid for, paid for by you. I don't think that would be very plausible to most taxpayers. Like, wait, why are we paying for a four-year camp for them just to go and have fun? Like, shouldn't, like, if that's all, if that's the main thing going on, then why shouldn't they, they pay for that themselves, especially since it does tend to be richer kids that are doing it. So why exactly should it be they that go and get this great deal? So, you know, I see, you know, like, for a, certain, if for a certain kind of student, then the leisure is fine. Although, again, like, even then, you should compare it not to having no fun at all, but to the fun of being a yuppie at an earlier age. So you did men so you did mention about credit accreditation inflation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So would you not think that if we redirect it all to vocational mm -hmm. teaching, then more trades would be more popular? And then wouldn't we have like an inflation on that point mm -hmm. and making those returns on the trades mm -hmm. less valuable? Yeah, I mean I agree that there would be an increase in the supply of people in the trades if it were offered as a more vocational option. Uh, the main difference is that when you're trained in the trades, you actually acquire the skill, right? So, you know, the, normal, the way normal academics work is you go and study Latin, and then you get a, go and get a better job. And, you know, that's something where you know, maybe it's good for you, but it can't be good for society unless the Latin actually winds up raising the productivity of the world. Uh, so, you know, or, you, know, you know, just to back up. So, you know, like in general, like, so if you get a raise because you are producing more stuff, then that doesn't have to make the world any poorer. It doesn't have to make the rest of the world any poorer. You create more wealth and then you receive more wealth. That can totally balance. 
but if you receive, if you create more wealth, or, you know, or but if you receive more wealth without creating more, then that's got to come at the expense of somebody else. And I say the main thing is that when you're actually training people to do a trade, that's one where that's the, the the good case. That's where you are increasing your own skill, and then you make more money. But you make more money because you're contributing more to the world, and that's why I consider this a more useful uh, you know, approach for society. So like even when the, you know if there's two jobs you know like one you know like the pay equal you know, pay equally so you could either study Latin or study carpentry, I'd still say well carpentry is better for mankind because the carpentry raise you will get by actually producing more homes, whereas the Latin raise you'll get just by looking better than other people that don't have the same credentials, so that's that's the key difference. Every time, other times I've heard you speak that you've you've allocated roughly 80% signaling mm -hmm. and 20% uh, mm -hmm. capital uh, or human capital. Mm -hmm. um, what, but but obviously you can get there in two different ways. You can have either 20% of the population gets 100% of the human capital mm -hmm. improvement, or or mm -hmm. some variant. Right. If you if you made the allocation within the different, what what would be? Yeah, obviously this is just a guess. But what would be your allocation? Mm -hmm. What percentage of the students are getting the bulk of the capture mm -hmm. of human capital? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, yeah, so that, that's a good question. So, I mean, I definitely say that people in more vocational majors in college are getting you know, a, a much larger share of the total amount of skills, you know, you know, but even in the middle of your life, I say that you know, not as much as you might think because even majors that seem totally vocational to outsiders usually have a lot of fluff in them. Or like, it may be extremely difficult fluff, but it's still stuff you don't need to know. So again, like my dad is a PhD in electrical engineering. He said he spent a lot of his time in school learning proofs. And then when he actually had a job as an engineer, how many often do they say, we need you to prove something? You know, never, right? So like, even in your very technical fields, or like, like in uh, computer science, a lot of time spent on computer science theory, which people in the area said, no, you don't use that when you're actually a programmer. Uh, like, you know, one interesting contrast that, I, that I've been told from people in the biz is that there's you know, like two rival majors. There's the computer science major and then there's the software engineer major. And the usual view is software engineering is much more practical, but it's seen as being lower status and easier. And so if you want to get the good jobs, you do the something that is less practical, but which is harder. And so you do CS rather than software engineering. So, I mean, if you were to you know, say you know, like out of like the, you know, so like, like, you know, like, out, like, you know, so like what percentage of the actual value of job skills is going to the roughly 25% of college students in the more vocational majors? So I, I'd be inclined to say something like, you know, 45%, something like that. But again, that's just a guess. So, you know, like they're punching way above their weight, but it's, but like it's very hard to find any field where everything you study is clearly useful. But think about this, law school, what's that, you know, like that doesn't, doesn't that sound like trade school? Like law school sounds like a trade school. And yet, what do they teach you in your first year of law school? They teach you the law of 12th century England. Right? Like, why? Well, my teacher taught me that, and his teacher taught him that all the way back to the 12th century. So that's what's going on here. Uh, you know, and, and, and you know, like, I remember, like, my wife actually like, like, you know, wound up you know, working in securities. So the, the security class that she took in law school was based on the law of the 70s. So it's in the, in the mid-90s, they taught her the law of the 70s. And then when she actually got a job, they say, yeah, you know all that law you learned? So it's completely out of date, so let's just start over. Uh, and don't assume anything you learned is still true because there have been big changes. So, uh, you know, like, you know, the system is, is so dysfunctional through and through. And by the way, I do not exempt my own field at all. <laughs> Economics is riddled with waste. I mean, the stuff that we teach, again, of course, a lot of it is just what, is that, what does the professor feel like talking about? Right? What entertains the professor? I want to go and tell people about the economics of the mafia. So fine, let's all talk about that. Like, are the students going to go and need to know that? I don't think so. I don't think I have any future gangsters in my class who are going to take advantage of what I've taught them. Uh, but, uh, you know, like the students don't complain as long as, you know, the grades are okay and, you know, the, and you aren't the most boring person they've heard all day. They're pretty happy, right? So, yeah, there, there is that. Um, do you believe that uh, <clears throat> to make education more vocational, uh, would that be uh, able to exist within our current public school system, or would we have to uh, look at more charter schools, mm -hmm. voucher programs, things like that? I mean, honestly, like, you know, I, I could see it going either way. So I mean, charter schools are huge right now, so that's a very logical place to go. 
I think you know, part of the problem, of course, is that charter schools give parents choice, and most parents don't want the vocational choice. Right, and and I, you know, I've got a, and I've got a story about well, you know, like why that actually is not so crazy, which is that, you know, to my mind, the main reason why vocational education is better, it's not so much that it's better for the student, although it's better for some students, it's just that it's a better investment of social resources. So again, you know, if you were have something where you offer uh, vouchers for vocational only and say that academic education you have to pay for, right? So I mean, I can see something like that happening. But you know, like even within the existing system, I can see something more like, uh, you know, like you know, reg regular schools doing it. Again, I, I will say, like I'm just, I'm very pessimistic about the likelihood that the system reforms itself. And again, nothing makes me more pessimistic than going to parent-teacher night, right? Because I go to parent-teacher night and I say, look, there's not a word I could say to these teachers here that would change their minds about their noble cause. You know, like you know, they're they have great, you know, they are they have so much confidence that what they're doing is awesome. And so, and then like they're not interested in research at all unless it's like studies show that what I'm doing is great. Sure, I never read these studies and don't even know what they would be, but they definitely show that what I'm doing is great. So, I mean, like I remember, like, you know, so there's actually you know, like one paper that goes over the evidence on does highlighting textbooks actually improve learning? Like, how many times do you have to take out a marker and go and highlight a textbook? Anyway, so there's a lot of research on this finding that highlighting is totally useless and. It, like, like we, could, we could save a whole bunch of pens as well as students' time if we just dropped it, right? And then I go to parent-teacher night, and they say, make sure that your kids have a, have a bunch of highlighters, because highlighting is one of the main ways that students will absorb this material. And I'm thinking, do I raise my hand and say, I'm, uh, like, I've read a bunch of papers on this, and that's just wrong? And I'm looking at my wife, and I'm like, well, I mean, like, the only thing I'd accomplish there is get my wife annoyed at me. This teacher's not going to listen to me. Like, do I really think that if I go and point out that what they're doing is ineffective, that they'll change? I just don't believe that, right? And, then, you know, of course, it's the same kind of feeling of ineffectiveness that I had when I was in high school myself. It's like, look, I've got some ideas about how to fix this, but no one seems to care, right? Of course, when you're in high school, it's like, well, it's because you don't know anything. And then eventually, I learned a lot more than I knew in high school. It's like, you know what? People still don't care. It doesn't matter that much what you know. Like, you know, people are very stubborn. They're set in their ways. And... You know, there's a lot of enthusiasm, but there's very little curiosity. Yes. Uh, I had a question as far as China versus the United hmm. States and the vocational uh, job market. It seems like China is continuing to promote vocational employment compared to the United States. So is that going to bring um, more money into China compared to the United States? Hmm. So, I mean, that's interesting to me. So, I mean, like, I've, I've read a lot about vocational education. I haven't read, I can't remember reading anything about vocational education in China. I can totally believe this, although I also know that China is currently doing a massive expansion of their higher education system. So it seems like, like my, my guess is that they are currently trying to become like us, right? Um, which, by the way, this, you know, Germany is the same way. You know, Germany with this great vocation, vocational education system, and yet they are moving away from it in the sense that, no, no, really the U.S. system is better. And like when I'm there, I say, no, you've got it right, we've got it wrong. Uh, so Switzerland is the one country I know of where they not only have a, a great vocational system, but they seem to totally stand by their vocational education system. But you know, in terms of what's going on with China, I can't honestly say I know much of what's going on. I don't think, you know, like whatever China is doing, I don't think that's going to matter much to people in the U.S. Cause, you know, people in the U.S., like, even more than people in other countries, I think are very insular, and, you know, like, pe you know, people in the U.S. Want, are interested in what's going on in the U.S. You, know, you might be able to get people in Denver interested in what's going on in Salt Lake City in their schools, but if you say, you know, like, in, you know, in Beijing, they're doing something differently, then, you know, it doesn't seem very persuasive to, you know, to Americans. But. Okay, other one questions? more question. All right, well, hang around for, uh, for a while if you've got something else you want to ask me. But uh, you know, th you know, thanks so much for coming. Thanks so much for uh, the hosts and the sponsors. And uh, and by the way, so you know, the, oh, you know, well, let me just say, say one other thing. So you know, you know, there's no reason for any of this to discourage you from getting the most possible out of your education because it's easy to get way more than you're getting. Of course, you know, one thing is just you know, like any class that you want to learn, you don't want to pay for, just go to it, right? And like the the professors will be delighted. Right, and you might make friends. Right, you know, like you'll meet new meet, meet professors who will say, "Wow, this incredible person who's actually curious in my subject." 
Uh, you know, like when, you know, what I always tell my kids is go through the list of faculty and find every faculty member where there's a 5% chance you might benefit from meeting them and meet every single person like that and just see what happens. And, you know, like most of the time, nothing will come of it, but you, know, you can go and you know, learn so much more and, and, make, and, and like make, make so many more connections than like most students. You know, like there's so many opportunities that they could be taking advantage of that they just don't do, which seems to me mostly just out of apathy and status quo bias. So you know, like, you know, if you want to actually get way more out of your education that you're getting, you don't need to pay another dime to do it. You're right here. Like, just, you know, like, like go, and open, uh, you know, go and look at the list of faculty, find people that seem interesting, and meet them on purpose. Right? And I think you will, in the end, like, it will, like, there's a lot more you can get out of that than you're currently getting. So why not try it? What have you got to lose? Okay, thank you, Ryan. Thank you.